Dive into the world of pocket billiards, where legends are made and pros play. Let's queue up for an exciting journey. Hey everybody, this is Chris Wilmots and back for another episode of the Pulling Around Show. Today we are here with Doomsday, Shane McMinn, arguably one of the best bar table players in the country. Um, and I appreciate you joining us today. It's been a, I mean, been, been trying to hook up and and visit, but I know I know you're busy. Absolutely. How's your uh, How's your leg doing? Oh, it's almost completely healed up now. Good deal. Good deal. Get this off. Awesome. All right. So, like I told you, this is just kind of so people can to get to know a little more about you away from the away from the table. Now, um, no. I lost you. Can you still hear me? That's the I just now. It's the first thing I've heard. Yeah, you went you went all you went all blurry. Yeah, you were frozen. Are you are you connected to Wi Fi or are you just using the data on your phone or Oh yeah, I think maybe if I connect to my Wi Fi. I'm using the data on my phone. Let me connect to my Wi Fi. Right, I can I can edit it and start over. See if I no. that way. All right, that should be better on mine. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. Uh, this is Chris Wilmoth, and I'm back for another episode of the Pulling Around Show. Today we are here with Doomsday, Shane McMinn. Uh, Shane, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we'll jump right into the questions, man. Just to kind of tell me, um, tell me about growing up. I know that uh, Billiard Palace was probably your home away from home for a long time, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about growing up and playing pool and how you got started. Well, back in those days, um, mid late 90s early 2000s they had a good 24-hour pool hall one of the best 24-hour pool rooms ever in the country jim mcdermott owned it um in tulsa oklahoma and uh it was open 24 hours and it had good equipment and uh, back then a lot of the best players from around the country and and biggest gambling matches were going on in tulsa so i had lots of uh, really good pool players to help guide me uh, across it plus uh kind of my dad kind of pulled me out of school really early for homeschooling when I was in the fifth grade and I was basically spending 24 hours a day in the pool hall so uh it was kind of a, a dream scenario as far as wanting to improve at a young age yeah I remember uh the uh billiard palace I mean just about any time you walk through that door yeah you, you couldn't even get sit down if somebody's asking you if you wanted to gamble yeah yeah front six tables usually always had thousand dollar sets uh, mm -hmm. high caliber players it was it was nice so tell me about some of your who some of your your favorite sparring partners growing up or now who i mean who you like uh well i mean i don't spar near as often as i used to usually i'm just grinding out these bar table tournaments but uh growing up gambling brian jones was a big one me and him would play you know over 20 hours at least over 20 times and he was just hard as nails would grind and uh would grind you out. And uh, you know, and then there's Andy Free Hoffman. Um, mm -hmm. um Chip and Joey were still a little young back in those days, so they really uh I wouldn't spar with them a lot. Me and John Gabriel usually used to team up, so we didn't really ever play against each other. Right. Um Tyler, Tyler Strong. Um, Shane Jones, uh, Greg Hogue. Yeah, we were all sparring it out all the time back then. Yep. Yeah. 
and uh and Jeff Melton. Jeff Melton. You know, he's, he's quite a bit older than both of us. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of gambling. Me and Jeff did. For old fart, he can still shoot though. He still plays really good. Yeah. Um. Then I think David Weaver. He started kind of late in life playing pool too, didn't he? Yeah, I've never known him to be a big uh, gambler or matching up. I just I've always seen him playing in the tournaments. Tournament player. I met him. In, did you ever go to Oklahoma City to those Cactus Jacks tournaments? No, I didn't. Those were a little before my time. Those were those were tough. Yeah. Um. So when did you realize that that pool is something that you could you could do for a living? Well, I realized it whenever uh, my dad quit his job and they were relying on me to make a living at 12 years old. And so I was making a living from the time I was 11 to the time I was 16, 17, making my dad's and my brother's living for them. Um, I wouldn't really say my brother. He had his own thing going on, making his own money. But as far as paying the rent, it was all up to me um, from a really young age. And uh, but it's just all that I wanted to do. And so I never really had thought about the future. I was just doing what I loved. And this is what it's turned into. So what's a what's what's up next for, for Shane? I mean, what, what events are coming up that you're. That you're I've got a Royce Memorial and um, Sticks and Stones in uh, Louisville, Texas. And then after that, I got a match with Chris. Uh, Ryan Hill was playing a set for somewhere around 15000 on bar table. You are playing where? Uh, in El Paso, Texas. Okay, way down there. Good, good friend of mine owns the pool hall, and he's staking me. Neither one of us has been there or played there, but that's uh, for his sake, that's where we're going. Okay. So what is what has been your, of all the tournaments that you've won, what's been your biggest? Um, well, like, uh, the biggest tournament and the most money I've won was probably a tie between the, uh, world bar table ring game. I won it two years in a row. That was really the first tournament that I had played in besides the U S open that, uh, had, a, were just full of pros and it was bar table. But the, the toughest tournament that I'm the most proud of winning is the big table, uh, uh, Southern billiard expo in, uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. Um, cause it was the toughest is a high entry fees, nothing but Europeans and Filipinos, top Americans and beat Roberto Gomez twice in the finals. And, uh, that's probably the one I'm most proud of. Did, did it pay more than white diamonds? No, absolutely not. It, it was $500 entry fee and, and there was some money added, but not a lot, but the white diamonds was just a really big Calcutta. That would have to be for the most money I've made. That would have to be tied with, uh, tied with the real bar table tournament because the real bar table uh ring game and it was a long time ago i think i was 18 or 19 and they had it two years in a row it was three thousand dollar entry fee just to play wow and so first in that you know and both of them ended up paying about 23 let's see i got second one year it paid 22 and then the next time the first time i got first and it paid somewhere around 35 or 40 i didn't, didn't even realize they had those big entry tournaments back then they did. It was only a two-year thing, and it was a, a poker chip style uh, ring game tournament. Gotcha. I got you. Yeah. So, so what part? What part did Danny and Evelyn play in your life? I mean, there. I know that yeah. Evelyn was probably probably the best tournament directors ever. Um, oh, I still think that as far as. Uh, I mean, really, there are only two, two ways about it. They run a better tournament than any place that I've ever been. They just, they will spoil you. They'll have every match timed out from the beginning. You know, she's completely impartial. Everybody, she enforces the rules and she's very stern about it. She doesn't play favorites. Yeah. In fact, I, you know, whenever I was living with them a lot, I thought I could get a break cut for me every once in a while. <laughs> she was harder on me than, than she was anybody else. Uh but they are definitely a mother and father father figure in my life, without a doubt. Uh, I first met him whenever my dad was bringing me around the pool hall playing, and they used to have a couple of their tour stops in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they took a shine into me, and I, I really liked them. 
And then, uh, you know, they're they're known for helping pool players in right. tough times. They've been around it their entire life and they know what it's like. And uh, they've and they sure helped me at a pivotal point in my life whenever. Uh, I was hard. I was hard up in different situations and they gave me a place to live. They've helped me out. Uh, I lived with them for two or three years. Right. Uh, once, and uh, they used to, I remember whenever I was 13 and 14, they used to pick me up on their way to St. Louis because they're from Ponca City. Right. And Tulsa would be on the way to go to uh, St. Louis. And they used to always pick me up and take me to that tournament from a young age. And uh, they've just been a huge part of my life. I still keep in touch with them all the time, see how they're doing. Yeah. They're, uh, they're on my list to interview. They'll, they'll slow down long enough. To... Yeah, they've, they've, they've done it all. Yeah. They, yeah. So uh, one person, another person I want to interview when I can catch him is, is James Walden. Cause I know he's got, he's going to have all kinds of stories. Um, and there's a lot of people like now that don't know how good of a player that he was. Um, what part? I mean, did he did he have any influence on your on your life growing up? Uh, yeah, there was a whenever I was really young, there was a moment in time where he was one of my favorite players. Uh, he, he lived in Oklahoma City, and I lived in Tulsa, so I didn't see him a whole lot. But he did play some big matches in Tulsa, and uh, you know, for the money around then, he was the man. You know, he played, he gave Alex Bagline the eight, you know, he gave Coltrane the spot. He played Jimmy. He just, he played a lot of them, 10 headsets and would prepare for a certain amount of time and then play him at a 10 headset. And I don't ever remember him losing one. I was, anyway. I was at the one where he played, where he played Alex, um, played those two mm-hmm. sets and then his backer was done. No, yeah. he, he didn't want, he didn't want any more. <laughs> he same yeah. weekend. Yeah. That same weekend, he played. Uh, he played Joey. You know, Joey's just Joey was just a pup, and yeah. uh, Alex Alex was playing Joey behind his back and beating the first set. And Joey just started crying. He said, "Man, I can beat this guy." And they played. They played another set. And, and Joey. Well, how old Joey at the time? Though? Jo- he must have been ten or eleven years old. This was in nineteen ninety seven or ninety eight. Yeah, yeah, so he, he was really, really young. He was young. Yeah. Gabe, Gabe was there. Alex was there with, I think, with John Cacharo. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And then Hillbilly was there. Um, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a fun, interesting match. Yeah. Um, who else have I got on here? Gabe. Gabe Owen. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he was around Tulsa for a long time. I know he's not originally from there, but. Yeah. Um, what part did he play? You know. He was the, uh, the first really good player that that uh took me under his wing you know whenever i was a barely even a teenager he would uh uh stake me gamble against me sometimes um but he played a big part we were hanging out whenever i was a young teen up to you know all the way up until 17 18 we were hanging out a lot and going places and uh we have a lot of history so he probably played as big a part with my game as just about any of them he was he, he was known. He was just right there. Like I mean, he wasn't. Uh, he didn't play as tough as matches that, that James did. James was beating tougher players and and bigger top pros. But Gabe was. He just very rarely lost. He was gambling all the time and big sets, making a lot of money. Um, back in those days, he, I think he's. Uh, see, I think the first time I played him, I was, I was eleven, and he was eighteen. <laughs> so he uh he was uh about seven years older than me, so yeah, it's about that time frame that he was just beating everybody all the way up until you know, even after he won the US Open. Yeah. Yeah. So that was two thousand four. Two thousand four. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um let's see. So Chip and Joey, I know they're a couple. They're a little bit. They're a little bit younger. Yeah. Um, you know, I read the the article a few minutes ago. You know, when you won the junior nationals, and then he won it the 
next year, or he got beat by Bo Runnigan? Uh, I don't know. Uh, a lot of those junior nationals, he was in a different division because I was playing in the 18 and under, and he was playing. He was winning. I was winning the 18 and under ones, and he was. He got a lot of seconds, I think, because Tyler Strawn was always getting first in those. And uh, I was always winning the 18 and under. I think I, I won the 18 and under whenever I was 14 or 15, 16, and 17. And the year that he did real well in it was the year that I was 18. And uh, I can't remember if 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 Bo won and Joey got second or if uh, Joey won and Bo got second. But I got fourth that year, and that's really the only year that I remember him uh, doing really good in the 18 and under. So who were some big-name players? Now that were that played juniors when you did, when was, uh, well Jesse Bowman was playing juniors back then. Um, was Meat, Meatball a little older? Mike Banks Jr. No, no, he was definitely playing. I mean, he was in a he was younger than me too, though. He was playing uh, in the uh, fourteen and under whenever I was playing in the eighteen and under. Uh, you know, Justin Bergman. Yeah, he, the first time I met him, he was eight years old, and he, he asked me for my autograph because I was <laughs> one of all the junior nationals, and he was just starting to play. Him and his dad went up to me, and that was in Secaucus, New Jersey, and uh, and he shot way up and got way better. But that was after I aged out. He didn't get much and taller, I, but he got better. <laughs> he didn't get much taller. He got a lot better. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, now yeah. he's kind of fell off the earth. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure what he's up to, but I think he's just doing his own thing. Yeah. All right. So, John Gabriel. John Gabriel. I mean, he's been playing professionally for for, for quite a while. I mean, I think he, I think he's older than I am. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just turned fifty, so I, I don't know. I don't know how John is, but I mean, I he, think he's ten years older than me. Uh, I just turned forty, so I think he's the same age. Same he's 50, 49 or maybe 51. He's right there. He played a big uh he was like a big brother role in my life. He was always he's been a real responsible straight lace guy. And uh throughout the years where I was um going through the pool scene at a young age with not going to school and without a lot of um parent figures, you know, I was I was going through uh drugs and stuff like that he always tried to keep me on the straight and narrow so he was always the responsible big brother yeah um with me growing up and still to this day he's a lot like that with me yeah he's he's, he's a good guy he's a good person yeah really noble works for a living all that stuff so when you uh when when you went out on the road i mean did you did, did you travel with chip and joey quite a bit uh, that didn't happen until later. Probably until I was in my 20s, thir you know, late 20s, 30s. Yeah, I've, I've gone with tournaments with them here and there, but I've met them at countless tournaments, you know, like. So yeah. You go on the road gambling together, just tournaments? Oh, yeah, never really. That Chip and Joey were were really tight together, but you know, I mean, they live in Oklahoma city. I live in Tulsa. Right. So a lot of the times we met up, it would be somewhere else at a tournament we were already at. They uh, went on the road gambling a lot more than I did. I mostly just, you know, went to uh, tournaments and then gambled while I was there. Gotcha. If I got the chance, right. but we've, we've done some going on the road together. You know, often I've gone down to Oklahoma city and stayed at their apartments, you know, for a week at a time, um, drinking buddies, uh, we got a big history together, but not really. I was as a pool player. I was already established by the time that we were together a lot. They were coming up and improving me while I was already. Uh, while, while I had already been playing for 10 years, you know what I mean? And they were just now coming up like me and Joey used to play whenever I was 14 and he was 11. And we used to play a lot for like the hundred dollar sets, and both of our dads would just be wringing our necks <laughs> the whole time we're playing, and we're like getting all upset and going to the bathroom and crying and coming back and playing just because we're trying to, uh, you know, he was trying to impress his father, his foster dad, and I was trying to make my dad happy, and it was a lot of pressure for both of us, and that's kind of how we grew up, just wanting to beat each other all the time because the pressure our parents were putting on us. 
not his parents per se, his foster dad. My right. real Yeah. So um so I know pool seems to be there's there's tournaments everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you look on Facebook and all the tournament sites and everybody's having tournaments. But yet pool kind of sucks for for the for the better play. The pros they have their events they go play. Yeah. I know you went and played in the the Carlisle tournament and and done real well there. And on the, on the snap tour, they're you know they're doing great things down there. Yeah, in Dallas, but but there's really nothing for the for the mid level like six between that six and seven hundred. Yeah, you know unless they're giving up big spots, there's really nothing there's nothing for them to play in. Well, I mean, really, I mean, it's no different than it was in the past for them, particularly the 60s, 70s. And, and in fact, I would say that there's more of an option for tournaments for them to play in. I mean, back in the day, I mean, like no one won except for the best players because everyone was playing even. Right. Um, well, but also back then, you didn't have 10 tournaments to choose from in five different states. I mean, you just got to travel to get to them. Pool has changed a ton. I'm not saying it hasn't. And, uh, you know, it's... A lot of ways, it's evolving into a kind of the opposite way of all other pro sports with the Fargo and the handicaps. But uh, I can't complain necessarily, but because for what I'm doing is I'm just trying to grind out a living. Right. So I've still got I get to play a tournament just about every weekend somewhere. Um, but there's just um, nothing. Clo- there's nothing close. Yeah, in fact, a lot of them schedule on top of each other. No, nothing close. But I mean, who wants? If you're really going to improve, who wants to do it? Sit there and stay in their hometown, their whole life. You got to travel, right? You know. But uh, yeah, the Fargo is something else, and I don't like it. <laughs> but uh, it's just the way the times are going. You know, the internet has a lot to do with it, and it's the way the game's evolving. And you just got to adjust or go bust, right? No, if, somebody, because, if somebody's well, coming up to their Fargo, yeah, it's too e- it's too easy to get information on somebody. You know, you don't just play in a yeah. dust. But that didn't just happen with Fargo. I mean, Fargo made it where it was ridiculous how the kind of information you could get on somebody. Okay. But the internet is what started that. Okay, you know, when the internet got real big, I mean, a lot of the going on the road and hustling and playing someone you don't know that was over. But now with Fargo, now they can just figure out how you play down to the, you know what I mean, down down within a ball or two. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it, it knocks a lot of action, but it creates a lot of action. Um, I don't really want to put a positive or a negative spin on it because it's just the way that the world is turning. And there's no reason to complain about it. It's just the way that it is. That's one of those, you can either, you can either give it up or, or adapt to it. Or adapt to it, yeah. It's the only choice we got. So, so uh, who's your uh, who's your sponsors right now? When do you have you, is is Durbin still your Q, Q sponsor? Yeah, Durbin's my main uh, is my Q sponsor. I don't ever see that changing. Uh, last Q he got me, I had for like eight years. This Q he has given to me right now. I don't assume I'll ever get rid of it. Uh, yeah, he's been a great sponsor and, and helped me out a lot. Bets on me when I gamble. Um, my next sponsor would have to be this Phil Hayes from uh, Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. He owns Club Billiards now. He okay. helps me out. I like to wear his shirts every time I get a chance. And uh, and uh, he's if you ever get a chance to go down to Club Billiards in Wichita, Kansas, it's an old school pool room. You've been there, I'm sure. Um. <laughs> I have, I have, I plan on going up there because I want to, um, you know, part of my part of this channel is going to the older pool halls and yeah, you know, finding out history about the place and talking to the old timers that are in there that play all the yeah, time. It's changed a lot, but it it has been around since the beginning of time. It seems like I don't ever remember a day when it wasn't there, and I'm sure it was there 20 or 30 years before I even started playing. Um, it's changed a lot, but I mean, Tiny Weber used to own it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure who owned it before him. It may have been that John Guffey or somebody. I don't know. But yeah, and he's my uh, he's the second sponsor. Third, um, Steve Wells with High Gear Apparel. Right. He uh, you know, gives me hoodies and and uh, clothing, 
and he makes nice stuff. I like his stuff. Um, and then there's uh, uh, JB Cases. <laughs> yeah, can't forget him. Dude, you can't beat his cases. I love them. Yeah. And but my main sponsor and one of my best friends is Gary Lee Cummings. He don't own nothing. He's just been my stake horse. And we've had a really good relationship for hell, I don't I can't even remember. It must be six, seven, eight years. But he's been my main stake horse every all that time and uh, we still keep in touch and I've always got his money with me so I can get half my Calcutta or if someone wants to gamble. And we've been good friends and business partners for a long time. Yeah. Probably yeah. Gary's and I don't, see it, I don't see that changing. So let me ask you, I'm going to ask you about two more people and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Let's, okay. um, Jim McDermott. Yeah. I mean, probably the world's best pool hall owner. Yeah. You know, we come up and, and, and visited with him a couple months ago, went to his house. Man, and just walking his house and all the pictures from both billiard palaces and yeah. magoos on his wall and yeah, um, I mean, just how good how good of a friend is is, is that guy? I mean, man, I'll tell you what, my whole growing up playing pool, I was scared of him. <laughs> he, <doesn't, laughs> he, he owned that place and he'd kick people out that deserved it, but he was just I was just scared to death of him. <laughs> Look, because he owned that place, he was a major you know, person of authority and uh, he's very intimidating, but, uh, I was I still am excellent friends with his daughter, love each other like brother and sister. And, uh, through that, I got to know him and then he softened up a little bit, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we're good friends and uh, I, I'm always going to be impartial towards his, uh, towards his establishment establishment. Cause that's where I grew up playing and that's where I did all the improving. That's where I had the best time of my life was there at the bear palace. And uh, there will be ever be a place that beats that to me, you know. Didn't they, uh, my uh, life. Him and his wife take you out to the junior national tournament. Yeah, yeah they did. <laughs> and the year that uh, Bo Runnings and, and Joey got first and second, they took the. Uh, we all got in a rented a van, and and uh, a bunch of the kids went down to DeKalb, Illinois. I think it's a suburb of Chicago. But yeah, he took us all down there, and he yeah, we you. have a lot of memories, a lot of memories with Jim. That's he without a doubt. He keep you online. But yeah, he was good. he was best friends with you know Mike Betts and and uh, and uh, Buddy Hall, and so you know he had he was definitely part of the old school group from back in the day, and a scary guy if you ever see him get bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he told us he told us a couple of the stories. Yeah. But when he had the home invasion. And, yeah. yeah. Oh, I absolutely adore him and his family. Yeah. That's a bad, or, yeah. bad ordeal. Yeah. All you right. know, life, life's pretty hard. It, it is. Yeah. Last person, and I know um, this kid, when he was when he was around, he was probably – he's probably one of the toughest players – he probably would have been one of the best in the world if he was still here. Yeah. As, as you mentioned him earlier, it was Tyler Strong. Tyler, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, they moved to Tulsa. We were really good friends. Uh, we used to always argue over who was better whenever they were 13 because whenever he was 13, he was playing awesome. And that's probably like close whenever I was – I probably played almost as good as I do now when I was 13. So we used to always argue over that. But awesome kid, always had a smile on his face, like was nice to everybody. Everybody loved him, had a sweet little girlfriend, uh, was friends with his family, his brother and his mom and his sister. You know, kind of a sad thing, though, is, is during that time, whenever he was starting to go off the uh, exper experimenting with what teenagers do, I was already hard up on drugs at that time, and uh, I couldn't do I didn't do near as much as I would have liked to guide him in the right direction up until his death. Uh, it's always be something that I regret, but, uh, he actually died just a couple blocks away from my apartment where I was living at the time. It's been right at, it's been right at 16 years and when it like December of 07. Has it been that long? I think so. 
Oh, wow. I think me and my wife had just got together. And it was in September. Yeah, it was seven days before my birthday. Yeah. So, it's, so he would be, uh, man, he'd be like 35, wouldn't he? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And he would probably, if he was here and still playing, I know he'd be, he'd give me, he'd give Shane Van Boning a run for his money for sure. He, uh, <laughs> There's no talent. But yeah, there's he had the biggest jump on it as anybody. He played so good whenever he's thirteen; it was unreal. It just depends on what he would have decided to do. You know, he may have chosen another path in life. Who knows? Yeah. So, somebody coming up wanting to start playing pool right now. So, if a kid comes up to you and asks you, "Hey, yeah. I want to start playing pool. What, what should I work on first? What would you tell them? I mean, I could just um, – the most important thing is to, uh, you know, have fun. Enjoy playing it. You just don't want to over-sacrifice to it because as awesome as pull is, it takes a lot of sacrifice to really, really surpass up and get there in the high rankings. And sometimes uh, life – it's really um, takes a little too much sacrifice sometimes. So I would never, I would always advise people to be smart and kids and upcoming players just to stay in school as long as they can and do what their parents tell them and just don't over sacrifice for the game. Because if you decide later on that you don't want to do it no more, by then you're kind of out of options. You've already right. sacrificed school and, and girlfriends and, and work and education. So. I would say just be careful with it and play as long as you love it. Keep playing it, but uh, just don't over sacrifice for it. Not until you're sure it's what you want to do. Well, Shane, I told yeah. you I, I told you I wouldn't keep you that long. Man, I yeah. appreciate I appreciate you joining me. No um, problem. I, I'd like to I'd like to get with you in person one day and, and interview you in person, and ask you some less personal questions, and and. Uh, um, and then I just, I don't know, buy you, buy you a soda. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, man. Hey, right. guys, if y'all enjoy uh, content like this, hit that subscribe button down below and give us a thumbs up and let us know how we're doing. And Shane, again, thanks for joining us. And My pleasure. We'll see y'all next time on the Pooling Around show. Right, have a good evening. And then, so the guy mentions this brand, so me being me, I'm like, well, shit, now I got to look at this closer. So I had a friend of mine get me one, and he sent it over, and I've been, you know, I looked at it briefly a week or so ago, and, um, but I haven't really had time to really get into it, so today... Me and a friend of mine are, are sitting back there talking about case designs and things we want to do. And I mentioned to him that I got this case and I told him the story. And he says to me, let me look at it. So I pull it down, let him look at it. Well, check this out. Watch this. So I'm not going to mention the brand. If, uh, if you guys know the brand, don't say anything, please. This isn't, this isn't my attempt to knock this brand. Um at all uh this is just my this is just my um my way of saying that uh not everything that appears nice is actually functional okay so check this out so this is a butterfly this is a butterfly style case as you can see here um sorry i don't mean to show the brand the uh Watch this. This is a normal cue, right? So we figured out that you can't put the cue in this way because it's tapered in here, okay? So this, this cavity here is tapered, okay? So that's number one, can't put the cue in that way. Now, put the cue in this way. Well, that's great, isn't it? Doesn't let it fall out. 
Okay, so this this cavity. Let's queue up for an exciting journey. Dive into the world of pocket billiards, where legends are made and pros play. Let's queue up for an exciting journey. Thank you. 